Good evening to all of you from India, but good morning to people in the United States. Good afternoon to people in Europe and other parts of the world as well. Uh, we are entering into the seventh thematic session of this conference on the theme, revisiting the criteria for law school rankings in the new normal. We have with us a very distinguished set of uh, leaders and law school deans and vice chancellors who will be discussing this issue. Um, first of all, I would like to extend a warm welcome to my own colleague uh, and moderator of the session, Professor Ashish Bharadwaj, Dean of the Jindal School of Banking and Finance and Director of the Office of Rankings, Benchmarking and Institutional Transformation. I also want to extend a warm welcome to Professor William Trenner, Executive Vice President and Dean of the Law Center at the Paul Regis Dean Leadership Chair, Georgetown University Law School in the United States. Uh, Professor Vesal Domingo, Head of the School of Law, University of Witwatersrand, South Africa. Uh, Professor Dr. Orlin Rakha, Vice Dean of the International Development and, and Co-Director, International and European Law School, Université Catholique uh, in, in France. And of course, uh, our, my dear friend, Professor Shantakumar, Director of the Gujarat National Law University, Gandhinagar in India. With those words of introduction, I'm going to hand this over to Professor Ashish Bharadwaj, who will be moderating the session. I will briefly disappear and will come back shortly while actively listening to all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Raj. Once again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the panelists and everyone who's listening to this live on YouTube. Uh, this is the seventh thematic session of this wonderful three-day long conference. And the topic of our session is revisiting the criteria for law school rankings in the new normal. Now, let me give you a very quick background uh, and a context to this session before we can get started with the discussion. Law school rankings conducted by independent agencies are tests of law school's pursuit of excellence. In some cases, these are rankings of institutions, also called as uh, rankings by subject area law within, broadly within social sciences. Now, generally the parameters and performance indicators in these rankings are number one, reputation among fellow academics and employers. Number two, research, which is measured through various different ways. Um, number three, you, we have uh, internationalization uh, in, in the form of international students coming in, uh, student mobility across borders, but also um, international partnerships and international faculty members. And finally, these rankings take into account quality of teaching, which is again measured by many different ways. And one of the prominent one is faculty student ratio. Law schools have been performing against these benchmarks in their advance towards excellence for quite some time. However, the current pandemic and the subsequent turn of events have altered the conditions in which law schools around the world have been pursuing excellence. Law schools have been prompted to reimagine themselves because of the pandemic and substantially they've begun to modify several functions internally. Assessing them against the old metrics of ranking agencies can pretty much defy the objectivity of rankings in the first place. It is against this backdrop that this panel becomes very, very relevant. When reimagining the criteria for assessing institutions, what should be the relevant considerations? That's one of the questions we'll try to engage on. Should the old criteria continue to matter? If they continue to matter, then shouldn't that be against newer parameters and newer ways of benchmarking and thinking in a post-pandemic world? Now, I have some information on, on how the big ranking agencies measure uh, institutional performances, but I won't get into that. Um, but as some headings, uh, uh, as someone heading the ranking and benchmark is benchmarking office at JGU, I can say that all the parameters that these agencies rely on have been affected this year. For ranking metrics, the next year may not be very different. And this calls for a newer standard of performance. I think a crucial test of any institution, including the law schools, is its resilience and the idea of sustainability. Uh, sustenance of its rigor and what it's trying to do on a daily basis. An institution can be resilient only if it has clarity on its vision, its mission, and on the core values that it's built on in both good times and bad times. Such clarity is perhaps a sign of excellence. Hence, 
Among other things, this panel will deliberate on the extent to which resilience of law schools during the pandemic and also in a post-pandemic world can be the test of their real excellence. My hypothesis or rather conjecture is that all criteria of performance assessment of institutions, including law schools, need to be reimagined and perhaps overhauled within the broader criteria of resilience. With this, I request all the speakers, all my fellow panelists to kindly give brief responses to three or four questions that um, I have, uh, I've kept in mind. And I would request you to keep your responses within three to four minutes uh, to each of the questions. Um, if you, for some reason you have more to say and you exceed uh, that time limit, you're going to hear a jingle, which is a cue that it's, it's time to wind up. Uh, and as an incentive, if you're able to crunch your answers within two to two and a half minutes, then I promise you, I'll give you an extra minute towards the end of the golden closing round. All right. So with that, uh, let me ask the first question. And I'm going to pose this question first to Professor Domingo uh, and then to Professor Trenor for his remarks, then Dr. Raka, and finally inputs from Professor Shantakumar. The question is, in a time when law schools across the globe are focused on ensuring academic continuity, are rankings of any significance at all? And if you are tilting towards a yes to this question, then how do you think we need to utilize rankings for academic excellence rather than thinking of them as administrative overhead for our law schools? Over to you, Professor Domingo. Thank you. So I'll start. So your question was, so despite I think all law schools across the globe focusing on ensuring continuity right now because we are in the, the COVID pandemic. I think the significance of rankings is that we as a community of law schools across the globe, universities, and our pr prospective students place value in the ranking system. As we are part of that narrative of placing value in the system, it will exist. So, and, and I think this is going to increase. And the reason why I'm going to lean towards the yes is because we will be competing for student admissions. So the value ranking systems become even more important, I think, post COVID-19. We'll be competing, I think, in a more rigorous online curriculum setting. And I think that may be something that law schools will be ranked on. If we're looking at the rankings itself, I think in some institutions, and I can only speak of my own institution, the ranking is part of performance management of directors, deans, and heads of schools. So one of your outcomes as, as, a, as a dean or a head of school is to make sure that your rankings have increased. And in some institutions, that's also attached to bonuses and incentives senior management. So rankings become important in that regard. Rankings as a tool in the way in which it's used right now, I have huge concerns around that. It is used as a, as a very competitive mechanism among staff, and I want to say senior management. So I would say we need to use it as a tool, as a tick box exercise, or as a punitive measure. I think academic excellence should be part of a shared vision and mission of a school and part of the career trajectory of any academic. So if you get all your stakeholders together, which is your management, your staff, your academic staff, which is your faculty um, and, you, and your students, you work within the ranking formulas to learn what is required by those ranking systems and be able to have the school excellence in alignment with your vision. And saying that, I do want to say one of the questions you raised uh, was whether we should change the ranking systems. I think we should change the ranking systems, but there are things that we can work with. So can survey, operations, partnerships, student extrusions, I think it's essential any law school to have. Scholarship is important. Um, institutional overview, international outlook, all of those things are important. Um, so I think they will play a role. It is who controls the narrative of those rankings. I think that's going to be important for the future. And I think discussions like this is important on schools because we can change that narrative. We, I think, should have the power to decide how we are ranked. Thanks, Jay. 
Thank you very much. We should have the power to decide if you want to get ranked. That's a powerful note to end on. Professor Trenor, are rankings of any significance now? Well, they are of significance because students will be looking at rankings and deciding what law schools to go to. But I think your question is exactly right, which is, what are the relevant factors now? Oh. And you know, I think the question that we're, we should be thinking about now with respect to rankings, as with so much else is, what can we learn from the pandemic, right? And so, um, and I think you outline it very well. So technology is very important, not as technology per se, but because it's relevant to the educational experience. And in fact, I think, you know, it's a better metric in some ways than faculty student ratio. Uh, what kind of resilience are we providing? What support are we providing for student resilience? Um, how focused are we on the diversity of our student body? Um, and what are we doing to advance the good of society as a law school? So those are four factors. And so I think those are more salient as we reflect on the pandemic. And so I think the inquiry is, how can we get perhaps a new ranking system or modify some of the existing ranking systems to focus on that? So just you know, very quickly to outline, we'll be talking about it more, but I think one way to measure these various, you know, very significant factors is through student satisfaction. So student satisfaction surveys in the United States are very significant for business schools, but not for law schools. I think that's something that we should be looking at and we should be asking students about things like, what was the quality of your education? To what extent did the, the school provide support for you when you were facing personal challenge? So I think that's one thing that we should be looking at. I think diversity should be a separate metric uh, that we should be assessing and that's quantifiable. And the third thing that I would suggest that we focus on is the amount of work that's done to support society and support change by law schools measured by things like the hours in clinics, the hours in externships, and the hour in practica, all quantifiable. So, but these are important questions. And again, the larger focus for all of us should be not just how do we survive the pandemic, but how do we learn from what we've achieved during the pandemic? Thank you, and thank you. This is really a wonderful program. I'm so delighted to be here. Th thank you so much for those remarks. In fact, now I'm before I go to uh, Dr. Raka, um, I want to add that based on my understanding of uh, three ranking systems, the QS, Times Higher Ed, and US uh, News, I don't think there is a parameter which exclusively focuses on student inclusion and diversity. Uh, which becomes really important and relevant now as we come out of this crisis. So thanks for pointing that out. Uh, Dr. Raka, if I can uh, come to you now, what are your thoughts on the relevance of rankings uh, in a pandemic and post-pandemic world? And how do, we, how do we understand them now? Yeah, thank you for the question and for the invitation. Um, I'm coming from uh, a country and maybe a continent that is... Uh, not in the same culture of ranking. And uh, I think here, uh, my first point is that uh, there is a difference of cultures on the ranking. And, and here, I mean, in Europe, we are not so much focused on uh, ranking the universities. And actually there is no official uh, ranking system on, on, in the European Union that is um, very effective. There are many private uh, websites that are giving some rankings, but they're not official and they're very much criticized. So um, I think here we should be very moderated on, on, on the, the concept of ranking because it depends on the countries uh, and it depends on the culture. So this is, this is my first, uh, first point. Because, and my second point is that the purpose of the law school, this is to educate. And we do consider in, in Europe, and I guess it's the same for you, but uh, maybe in the way to express this is, the, this is different, is that it is a public service. 
And public service should not be, in a sense, ranked, but this is this should be more assessed and should, we should more control the quality of teaching, the quality of education, and instead of introducing competition uh, between each other, but more um, improving the, 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 the public service everywhere. And so this is my, my second point here. This is to say that uh, um, it, we don't rank the, 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 the courts, for example, in the justice which one is the best. We don't rank, uh, um, I mean, here on the continent, we don't rank hospitals. We don't rank many things that are considered as public. Um, so except the UK, uh, uh, in, in Europe, there, there is no, no, no ranking again. So if we do consider the rankings, because of course I don't want to be too much against the, 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 the topic, and, uh, but uh, there are plenty of criteria that should be taken into consideration. And of course, if your point is to say that technology should be introduced as one of the criteria, of course, today this is something that should be in, but there are so many uh, points that should be taken into consideration. And sometimes when I looked at uh, the, the list of criteria in, in other countries, and of course the US uh, are leading on this, uh, very much. Um, there, mm, I mean, there are many things that are not in and, and that could be added. And it seems to be very complicated to uh, rationalize everything. And this is a matter of choice at a certain point. And my last um, opinion, my last point is to say, it is a tool for bench benchmarking, it is a tool for communication. So to put, I mean, forward what is good in some universities. And here it is not because a university is good on research that a university is good on teaching. There may be very good professors publishing very good articles and having a brilliant career on research, uh, but uh, the, the, the education system or the, the pedagogy or the, the degrees that are proposed are not innovative. And they're not, I mean, we should distinguish clearly the different objectives within uh, the, the, the rankings because uh, the categories are not the same. And I mean, research is not, um, is, is not pedagogic. So yeah, these are my first uh, point here. Uh, maybe it also to counter argument uh, what uh, can be said. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Professor uh, um, Shantakumar, we heard uh, two, three different views, uh, a lot of focus on uh, student admissions and well-being. We heard about student diversity and inclusion. And then we heard a third view that education, higher education, law education is a public good. It's not for everyone and it's a choice. Now, here in India, uh, you must have noticed the impetus on rankings, not just by the private agencies, but also by the government through NIRF. NIRF. What, are your, what are your thoughts on uh, significance of rankings now and how do we understand them? Yeah, uh, Professor Ashish, thank you so much. Uh, in fact, my answer to your question is, uh, do we need ranking even at this time? Yes, my answer is yes. Uh, since all, this is the challenges uh, posed by this pandemic are almost similar to every institution and all institutions are similarly placed. I feel that the rankings need to continue. Rankings are, uh, you know, in fact, no, it, it is of more significance now, especially when uh, a, a, this pandemic has affected the mobility, the students can't go around and see for themselves or meet peers our seniors to discuss about the quality of an institution where they are going to spend the next few years of their life. Therefore, they can uh, at least trust these ranking institutions, especially the ranking institutions, uh, what you have mentioned. But at the same time, I also agree with you that the ranking can't be the, the, the criteria and the metrics can't be the same. The, the ranking agencies should need to uh, tinker those uh, criteria and uh, metrics, and they need to be redefined, uh, reflecting all the challenges 
which were posed by this pandemic especially on you know many criteria such as uh, what you said about uh, student diversity especially international diversity when there is a lot of restrictions on transportation travel how do you expect uh, institutions to perform well in this criteria and especially under that metric metric so therefore my answer is yes ranking should continue because we have been continuing as an academic institution we have been uh, imparting uh, uh, learning you know th throughout this pandemic of course there was a disturbance initially for few days during the first lockdown thereafter things have almost become normal faculty members have adapted to the situation students have adapted to the situation we continue to do the same thing only difference is we are not meeting face to face but then things are happening online so i think this is my point that ranking should continue but the ranking should reflect all these challenges by modifying the key criteria and the metrics that is what is there currently applicable thank you ashish thank you very much uh, professor shanta kumar i would also like to uh, if i may a follow up question for you um when we heard from the other panelists about diversity inclusion um well being of students of learners and even faculty members and staff members uh do you think this is of uh, uh it's something that indian institutions including law schools in india need to be mindful of simply because of the sheer uh, diversity we have and some uh, very extraordinary socio economic challenges uh that learners uh, face in this part of the subcontinent so any uh, quick reaction to that uh, before we move on no uh, definitely uh, this pandemic has affected all of us uh, especially uh, you know the the uh, kind of diverse students uh, uh, who come to the public law schools in india uh, from different economic background from different social background and from different regions for example we are finding it uh, difficult even to reach them uh, through this online platforms because uh of course even if the student can afford to have all these things but then these facilities are not there take for example states like jammu kashmir are the students who are coming from the northeast we have reservations for these states but then we, we can't continue with the same kind of uh, education that what we can offer so this is something which uh, we need to rework especially in india i don't think we can continue with the same ranking parameters with the same criteria same metric the employability for example uh, the employers coming to the campus has reduced drastically so the kind of uh, uh, campus placements that used to happen has reduced uh, in fact the the uh, the amount of publishing has reduced because many publishers have not come out with their publications uh, during this time so a lot of things have got stuck here and there i i, I don't think the we should be assessed with the same criteria very interesting and uh, just for uh, to inform everyone the major ranking agencies in the world uh, the ones that i mentioned earlier all of them place significant uh, importance or statistical weightage to the parameter of reputation to the parameter of publishing in specific uh, journals so the challenge that uh, 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 professor talked about is it's real and it's going to affect institutions So now let me move on to another question which kind of touches upon uh, the concerns that have been uh, raised by all the speakers the 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 pandemic has brought to the forefront deep seated socio economic disparities in our societies um on the front of students and but also on the front of faculty members however in the last 8 9 months we have noticed at least in india that technology emerged as a sole enabler for institutions particularly law schools to ensure academic continuity as well as engagement with society engagement with students with society um in the form of legal aid in the form of conflict resolution technology was the only way to do what law schools were supposed to do now given that blended learning might be here to stay how important will it be to evaluate number one the tech readiness of law schools to cater to all the things that you've mentioned ensuring student wellness diversity inclusion and much more 
and how important will it be to evaluate engagement with social service uh, for the law schools? Can I uh, request Professor Domingo for, for your comments on this? Thank you for that, but I, I just want to jump very quickly. I'm going to ask you to indulge me. I just want to let everybody know that we should also think about diversity of staff and not necessarily yeah. as, 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 as well. And then in terms of the ranking, while we're thinking of criteria, we should also be thinking about the weighting which is given to those criteria. Um, and, and I'll speak to that a little bit. So there's not equal weighting when it comes to research and publication and reputation. And I'll give an example. For scholarship, the Times Higher Education weights it at 56%, well, while the Shanghai um, ranking system weights scholarship at 60%. Part of institutional overview is your financial resources and your infrastructure. So when we go to the detail, there's, there's, there's much more that we can unpack. But your question, let me get to that, is, is, is one that's very interesting. I do think that the next ranking criteria will have to take into account tech readiness um, of law schools. There's no doubt that we will never teach the same again in a post-COVID-19 world. Blending learning, I think, will be with us. I also think that we have now what we call our digital natives. And we were, I think, some of us digital immigrants coming into it. Our students are tech savvy. Um, we are entering the fourth industrial revolution. We need to think about the kind of graduate that we want. Is it the same graduate that we want in a particular profession and that's just teaching law? Are we seeing law now as something entrepreneurial and is it changing? And how do we meet those, those, those fourth industrial revolution changes? Both in terms of our curriculum, I want to say, and in terms of our teaching. Um, and I think that will no doubt impact on and ranking systems. In terms of um, online learning and blended learning, I also want to point out that what we've done as laws, and, and I say this very loosely, is what I call emergency remote learning. I, I think there are certain schools that's been doing blended learning, but we've gone in, lockdown happened, and we had to, to put courses online. I think that's different to having structured online programs. And it's an exciting opportunity now that we're in, that we can in investigate that. Because most academics, were, especially those that, I wanna say from my school, we're historically a face-to-face -face institution. There's been resistance to moving online, the quality, the integrity, everything of the, of the, of the curriculum and the degree will be um, diluted in a way. So, so academics are coming on board now. They, they, they're saying, well, you know what? There are exciting opportunities for this. When you, when you talk to um, rankings in terms of social services or community engagement, I think those parts are things that it's things that it's an add-on. The more clear programs with students but I also think that with technology now, if we think about gender-based violence and access to justice, we need to read how we're going to use technology and emotion to create greater access to justice. And I speak from the context of South Africa, which I think is also very much like India. I've, I've heard what was said. We also have students who are sitting in rural areas, no connectivity, no data, no electricity. We have lots of people in, in, in poor communities that don't have access to justice. And so mm. what kind of law students do we want? And what kind of product does that? So I do think um, readiness for law schools, and also later or fully online um, law courses will, will be, we have to keep in that that will be part of a system. That's Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for your remarks on that. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, Professor Trinor on this. Uh, what are your thoughts on tech readiness of law schools, uh, access to justice, and broader engagement uh, uh, with social service um, as we come out of this crisis? I think they're exactly the right things to focus on. Um, so let, let me start by talking about technology. Uh, that has been uh, a big focus at Georgetown. Uh, and one of the th things that I'm frankly, you know, always highlight is that our associate dean for curriculum 
Uh, Dean Polom is actually a computer scientist as well as a lawyer. And so he's been, first of all, very focused on preparing us in terms of technology, and then has really been wonderful in terms of, you know, guiding us through uh, the pandemic, you know, even to the level of writing code uh, that makes it easier for the classes to, to, uh, to work. I, you know, I just, um, you know, I, we're, we're very fortunate and I think, uh, and uh, it really has prepared us very, very well for this moment. Um, I think the, what I, I think a large point for us to think about with respect to rankings is a lot of the rankings have focused on inputs, uh, particularly in the United States. So um, student faculty ratio is an input or in the United States, how much money you are spending per student is an input. Um, I think that's not what we should be focusing on. So we could measure, for example, what your spending is on technology, but that's an input. We should be focusing in on outcomes, on outputs. So again, I think the technology, we've been very focused on making sure that students learn effectively in this environment. I think the, the way to measure outputs are in student satisfaction. Uh, diversity is something that you can measure by both you know, the by the measure of both the students and I, just to echo Professor Domingo, the faculty. So that's quantifiable. And again, I think you're measuring an output. Um, so kind of just a, again, kind of a couple of large points. The focus on technology and diversity is absolutely right. I'm very proud, uh, Georgetown, we are really laser focused on technology and on the diversity of students and on faculty and um, you know, in a way that has been very fortunate at this moment of pandemic. But in terms of the ranking systems, I think the, the focus should be in a way that it has not historically been on outputs, outcomes, as opposed to inputs, which kind of over award, not how well you do things, but how much you spend on them. Thank you very much. Uh, I, if you don't mind, I, I would like to ask a follow-up question. And there's a reason why I, I I blended the tech readiness part uh, with engagement with social service and with society, because in this pandemic, perhaps for the first time, we got disconnected, not just with our institution, with our students in a face-to-face -face manner, but also with people in our community, with society at large. But one of the key roles of a law school is to continue to engage with the society uh, continue to provide uh, uh, solutions and remedies in whatever way they can. So does this tech readiness also help law schools sustain and pursue their engagement with society as law schools have been doing it? Yes, absolutely. That, you know, it's a very important point. So uh, just a couple of dimensions that I want to highlight. One is uh, providing services uh, for the social justice services, clinics, practice externships, the technology is really crucial. Uh, so then, for example, in the United States, many pr court proceedings are now online. So having the technology that allows you to do that is essential. Um, the other point that I want to highlight is, again, I think the pandemic has made us focus on things we should be focused on. Again, social justice, Georgetown's motto is laws, but the means justice is the end. So the pandemic has shown how salient that must be. And I think it's also appropriate the way in which law schools are responding, not just to the challenges of representing people online, but also to the specific challenges of the pandemic. So just as an example, again, in the United States, there's really been a crisis because Many people are in prison for minor crimes and are really at risk of infection and death. So one of the dimensions that we focused on is having our clinics represent people uh, who are in, in prison to get them to be released. So again, that's a, that is a response to the pandemic uh, and I think has really made a difference. Now, I don't know a way to quantify that, um, but it's exactly what I think law schools should be doing, responding to the particular crises of the pandemic. Right, thank you very much, Professor Trainor. 
I want to take this question to the next uh, panelist, Dr. Raka. Uh, you've heard what the other uh, two panelists had to say about uh, law school's engagement uh, with the society and also whether tech readiness uh, counts or should count as we go forward with law school rankings. What are your thoughts, uh, Dr. Raka? Of course, I, I completely agree with uh, um, the two uh, former speakers on this. Um, we need to evaluate um, the, the readiness of each university to invest in, in, in technologies. But uh, maybe it is not enough because once you have the technology, you need to form, you need to educate not only the students how to learn online, but also the professors how to teach online. And there, there is uh, also, we should assess the content and the way of teaching, the way of learning. So we need to change also the rules, uh, the internal rules of the, the, the faculties on uh, how to behave online, how to uh, maybe to have shorter classes than before, uh, because this is easier to have communication with the students uh, physically when you're in the classroom. Uh, to catch their attention, you make sure you have the eyes contact, that makes sure. But um, online, this is, this is not easy to, make, to, to, to be sure that you catch their attention. So the way of educating is not the same physically and online. And, and evaluating the investment in technology is not enough. We shall evaluate also uh, the, 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 the content of the, of the courses and the way how it is, it is uh, done uh, online. So there is a change of rules. Um, maybe we need a bit of time because actually everything is renewed this year and everybody is adapting uh, the, the, their, the programs in their universities to, to, to the pandemic and for sure one part of this uh, of those evolutions will remain after we will change we'll have maybe two ways of teaching after after this pandemic and we'll be ready to older crises and and maybe if this is something that is coming back in the future we'll be more prepared than than now what is great and what is common for all of us in the world is that uh, we have similar platform uh, that we all of us use and 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 but all not all the universities are investing enough but um, everybody are using the same I mean most of them there are American softwares zoom teams and so on they're very useful and and we're, we're using them uh, um, all of us so yeah of course I agree with uh, with you that we need to assess this but maybe we need a bit of time uh, because we're in a transition. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, to our last speaker, Professor Shantakumar, um, I would also like your reaction to the question on tech readiness and how to continue engagement with the society. G given that there's a very, very difficult dilemma and a challenge that, that Indian law schools have to face. On the one hand, there is this huge demographic dividend uh, and the responsibility of including many, many students in the formal higher education framework. But on the other hand, we have this massive digital divide, not just across the socioeconomic groups, but also across gender. So given that, uh, with this context, how would you react to the tech readiness and social engagement of law schools? Yeah. Yes, uh, Professor Ashish, in fact, uh, uh, I agree with you completely that uh, technology has been a great enabler for uh, law schools during this ongoing pandemic to ensure uh, not only academic continuity, but also different kinds of academic collaborations. In fact, I, I could uh, see uh, the kind of activities that has happened during this last six, seven months would not have happened without the help of technology. Uh, especially, I'm not talking about the regular teaching and learning, what was supposed to happen during the classroom time, but the kind of webinars and the seminars, the kind of conferences, the kind of uh, speakers that we could get all because of use of technology. We could get very easily speakers from the US universities to speak to our students 
that's because of one simple reason that they don't need to get out of their home and they don't need to spend days in traveling the visa and all those things and at the same time uh, uh, with the same one hour of time they can reach out to our students which would not have been possible uh, without the use of technology so therefore technology has been a great enabler during this time and uh, we need to be very grateful uh, to this uh, technology for supporting academic institutions that is one point second is uh, given that the blended learning might be here to continue it is certainly very important to evaluate the tech readiness of law schools especially the kind of investments that a law school is making uh, towards the it infrastructure training faculty and staff in using technology all these things should become the necessary criteria for future rankings in fact uh, this can be an indicator to measure the resilience of the university uh, during this pandemic how university scoped up to, to this particular situation and how they ensured the continuity of learning therefore they ensured that there is no loss of learning happening to students so this should be one of the key criteria and i i, I know that in india uh, uh, professor ashish you must be in a, you, you are completely aware of it this you, you, uh, your university was the first university to be uh, certified with that e lead certification with the qs i gaj uh, uh, came out with immediately to recognize uh, the resilience of universities with respect to, with respect to using technology in uh, teaching learning process so that is something which we need to recognize and universities which have resorted to technology which had invested in it infrastructure which had invested in uh, training their faculty and staff to use technology to ensure continuity of academic uh, le teaching learning i think these institutions need to be rewarded uh, through this ranking process by taking this criteria and coming to the second uh, uh, part of your question like doing uh, during this pandemic how how the uh, students of our law school were engaging with the communities uh, in fact i know, uh, i can only talk about my university and the kind of uh, activities that uh, the law, the uh, students of the law school clinic were engaged in uh, you might be aware uh, that the kind of crisis uh, which the laborers had to face due to this migration because of the complete lockdown so during that time the uh, uh, the students of our law school clinic they immediately uh, you know woke up to that situation and they responded they tried connect, connecting with people all without moving from their homes say so only by using technology they connected with their peers their friends in different parts of the country and uh, they connected with alumni to mobilize funds we they approached the university and we also supported with them uh, certain funds to help this uh, migrant laborers and uh, uh, professor ashish it's very difficult to believe uh, when i look at the kind of uh, work that uh, the, my students have done in the law school clinic they have almost uh, provided uh, monetary support uh, in terms of providing them the groceries that are necessary for a month to survive this lockdown and also by arranging them you know buses and train tickets yeah. to ensure that they reach their home yeah. place so that kind of work they they have done and all these things need to be taken into account while ranking uh, is uh, uh, continuing these these are some of the important uh, changes in criteria that the the ranking institutions should take into account. wonderful thoughts thank you so much professor shanta kumar uh, we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience um, but i'm uh, i have this one question that i really wish to ask all the panelists based on what you've just shared with uh, all of us and the question uh, is about physical and mental mental well being of students of staff members of faculty members uh, because of all the challenges uh, uh, that we have discussed including uh, being tech savvy the we've heard a lot about exhaustion that students and uh, staff faculty members have to go through because of continuous uh, engagement with our computers and our devices so while we are reimagining this entire uh, ranking framework for law schools uh, and we are trying to factor in resilience we are trying to factor in uh, inclusion diversity student welfare uh, 
how do we ensure going forward if we have to be tech ready that we also have the right systems in place to ensure ven- mental well-being of our students and people in the institution can i uh, uh, anyone would like to go first or i can just request professor domingo oh, all right professor Gee, Turner. Is, no go with professor domingo i don't want to all right please Okay, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, mental health and wellness of both staff and students has been a huge thing that we had to deal with at first during the, the pandemic. Um, not only during this time, but I think before that, our university has a counseling um, system. So we have a unit which is um, where students can either call in We have psychologists online that can assist students. We've seen an increase of that um, over the the COVID-19 period. And this was that many of our students went back home. Um, As I said, the socioeconomic, there's huge socioeconomic disparities in South Africa. There's huge gender-based violence in South Africa. Um, There was the ability to go online by yourself and manage your own teaching. Um, affected students, just being overwhelmed, um, affected students. So we had a system where students could call in. The problem with that system was that we didn't realize how, how small the unit was. We, we need to grow it. Um, in terms of staff wellness, we also have a online system where staff can call a psychologist. But besides those systems, I also think it's important that as leaders, and I, and I speak for myself as a, as a head of school, that you constantly communicate to your students and staff that you were there for them, that messages go out to them to affirm everything will be okay, that um, the positive messages goes out continuously so that they know what, what the exam period is going to be like, what the online period is going to be like. And I'm speaking about both staff and students because there was heightened anxiety about moving online for both staff right. and, and, and students. But when I speak about mental wellness, I think we, we have to look at all support structures that we have for mm-hmm. students. And it's not only um, offices that deal with mental wellness. I want to say this, we need to have, and what we have at this is a gender equity office where we deal with cases of gender-based violence, where there's rape right. on campus, Um, where there is discrimination against LGBTQI people. So we're talking about a holistic system to assist students. So it's what we have within our faculty is what we call the Road to Success program. It's a program to assist students. And I want to say you have the curriculum and then you have things outside of the curriculum. How do we assist students navigating the process? How do, they, how do you teach them to study? How do you teach them to manage huge workloads? How do you right. teach someone who's coming from a rural area to engage with a student in an urban area? So there are many, many dynamics. And I think those kinds of support systems probably, I think they do play a role in ranking systems and it would be nice to see them in. But like we said, we don't also just want to be having tick box exercises where we do things because we're going to be ranked. I think we need to be truly committed to our students to say, this is your home away from home. And we really care. And I think this pandemic for both. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor Domingo. Um, Professor Trenor, your thoughts on this? So I think you know, there, are, there are two dimensions. One is the support that you provide for students and as Professor Domingo has, has said, for staff and faculty when there's no pandemic. Uh, that's something that at Georgetown Law, we've been very focused on. So uh, we have a staff of psychologists who work with our students. We have somebody who works with faculty and staff. Uh, we have a program for, called RISE which is for students from historically underrepresented groups uh, that provides them support starting before they arrive at law school. Uh, We have a director of diversity and inclusion. So this is the framework that we have even before the pandemic. Uh, Then the question is how you respond to the pandemic and the, the challenges that people are facing as they have, as they lose family members, as they themselves are often sick, uh, as they have the isolation uh, that the, the pandemic is, we're all isolated. So, so one thing that we've done is we've increased the counseling. 
Um, so we're actually in the process right now of putting together a program of online counseling uh, that you know, is dramatically more than we've had before and that will be available to everyone. So important. Uh, I think it's also very important to focus on what you do in the classroom. So uh, one of the things that we were talking about a moment ago is it's very hard to, to be on a Zoom class for two hours. So we have, we have two faculty groups. Uh, one is focused in on student support and one is focused on making the pedagogy supportive of students. So we have faculty meetings and we do things, for example, like uh, you break up the, the Zoom session. So rather than go two hours or an hour, you go to a shorter period and then the students take a break. Uh, you also do variations. So you send people out into Zoom breakout rooms or you do polls. Uh, we also encourage the faculty members at the very beginning to come to the Zoom room earlier so that they can actually interact with the students informally in small groups before the classes start and then do the same thing afterwards. So again, I think there, there, there are a couple of things that I just highlight. One is it's so important for all of us law schools to be focused in on student well-being. You know, ours is a profession that's a very difficult profession. And so we have to have holistic education under any circumstances. And then I think that, you know, the question then is also in this pandemic where people are feeling isolated when they're experiencing loss, I think we all have to be focused very, very laser-like on how we provide students in support as they navigate this so challenging time. And again, faculty and staff as well, because they are also feeling this difficult time themselves. Thank you, Professor Trenor. Uh, Dr. Raka, what are your thoughts on um, uh, perhaps including uh, counseling uh, systems for mental well-being as ranking criteria going forward? Professor Trenor took all my main arguments, so I completely agree with him. Uh, um, I mean, this is, uh, of course, um, there are two, two, two points. First, all the universities, and this is what we have done in our, in our university, uh, they need to assist uh, the students, I mean, with psychologists, and also uh, financially for some of them, because uh, this is a final challenge for many students uh, to stay at home alone. Uh, some of them, they have to work uh, and um, to, to finance their studies, and they cannot work during that time, and it may be a hard challenge financially. So here in our university, we have um, provided uh, financial help also for uh, the students that were affected, and also for the international students that come from far, um, far from in France or you know, on the continent or even outside uh, of Europe. And they may be completely excluded uh, from their family or their the, the, and the society. So of course we have tried to do our best uh, to 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 make sure that everybody is involved in in the university and in case of trouble they may be helped. Um, the other point is uh, it, all the crises they are a great challenge for everybody to renew uh, the, the the behaviors and and this is a great challenge to propose to have new projects, to have something. So for students, also for professors, for everybody, for the universities, this is, uh, we may innovate more in a time of crisis than when we're in the usual uh, time. So, uh, and here progressively, I see very nice um, uh, projects that are coming either from uh, the, the students themselves in associations so, for example, a new kind of moot court competition, uh, debates online, uh, legal clinics that did not exist, different ways. And here, for the students, they, took, they should take the advantage of, of, of being at home or being, I mean, isolated to, to think, to read, to innovate, to, to do something else that was not right. done before. And here I see very nice projects that are uh, growing um, paradoxically, thanks to the, to, to the crisis. Thank you very much, Dr. Raka. Uh, Professor Shantakumar, your thoughts on the uh, issue yes. of mental well-being and readiness? 
yeah one thing is as uh, you know all the earlier speakers were uh, uh, approaching this question from uh, two different phases one is uh, the pre pandemic time of course uh, universities uh, have the uh, counselors qualified counselors to counsel students on their mental uh, well being uh, so as a university we also have and we also provide all those things and in fact uh, this is something which is a very very important criteria and a metric to be taken into account by ranking institutions the kind of uh, mental well being and the support that an university provides to its students should definitely be a criteria and second is during the pandemic during the pandemic is number one uh, what we consciously decided the senior management in the university is that whatever decision we will take whether it may be the duration of the class or the kind of a question paper or the mode of examination or the time of examination we always keep this as the first in the checklist whether anything any decision of ours is going to bring any kind of pressure stress on our students on the families of our students and all these things and uh, we kept that in mind to uh, take a decision keeping you know the mental well being of the students because we are also currently living in the same circumstance so we actually know what kind of uh, uh, problems that our faculties are facing the students are facing therefore we always uh, took it as a point to ensure that we will not do anything which will affect their mental well being thank you thank you very much it seems this is uh, that's all the time that we had for this wonderful session thank you so much professor domingo professor trainer dr raka and professor shant kumar for your insights and your comments we have run out of time there are still so many questions left unanswered but i'll hand it uh, over to raj now well thank you very much what a fascinating panel discussion on such a wide range of issues connected with rankings and even beyond i want to thank uh, professor trenor uh, professor domingo and of course um, uh, professor raza and uh, Professor Shanta Kumar, thank you, Ashish, for chairing the session. We will take some of those issues that has been raised in this panel for some of our future discussions as well. I would like to uh, extend my deep uh, gratitude for all of you to be part of this uh, conference. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.